guys, and welcome back to the Motor Recon Podcast. I'm your host, Adam. I'm joined again today by Rob. Uh, what we're going to do today is just discuss uh, the F1 2020 pre-season testing, given the fact that it has just finished. Mm-hmm. Um, so we thought we'd give our, our sort of opinions on a few things and also look at a, uh, a couple of the winners and losers from the from the testing, from what we can see so far. Um, one pretty key standout one for us is the obvious Mercedes um, new system, the new DAS system. Yeah, um, it's worth noting as well that testing has shrunk down yet again this season. It's well, just it has, six it? days. Yeah. So obviously they had a lot to test. Uh, we're not going to go into the times either because they're fairly unrepresentative. They are at the moment, aren't they? So you don't know how much fuel they're running. Frankly, you'll only know how good outright pace is on sort of qualifying in Australia. Yeah. That's when we'll know. Um, obviously. A big winner, uh, obviously we're looking at the F1 article here, the big winner is Merck, Uh, not just for DAS, obviously the dual axis steering is part of that. Uh, In layman's term, what that is, is the driver can move the steering wheel forwards and backwards to change the toe of the two front wheels, so that's T-O-E. Yeah, when you refer to toe, you show them that camber and things like that. So the toe is moving inwards and outwards like that. Okay. So what happens is, obviously, normally F1 cars with a run a, with a little bit of outward toe, that helps them with the cornering. But that normally means they scrub the tires a little bit on the straights. Yeah. Now they're willing to accept that loss because they more than make up for it in the corners by running that toe. What Merck have been able to do with Das is run the straights, pull the steering wheel back, and move the toe in which gives them slightly better straight line speed, but more importantly will drastically help them, well, it will help them with the uh, tyre saving. So looking after tyre degradation. Yeah, so whereas other teams are having to make that compromise and they're scrubbing their tyres on the straights, wearing them down, Merck aren't having to do that as severely. That over a long distance could have a huge advantage. We don't know. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. I suspect it might. Like say, Even if it's only a couple of laps per... I don't know, per race. Makes example, all the difference. A couple of laps in F1 is a lifetime. Yeah, exactly. And Makes if you're all pitting the and they don't have to, then... They also, yeah. obviously, they ran very strong in other ways as well. Um, they did 903 laps over the six days. Um, the only problem was, obviously, a little bit of unreliability with this year's engine. Yeah. There have been stoppages. And that... I know Hamilton, if they can keep the system up and get that reliability sorted, it looks like Merck's going to be another, another clear winner again. However... If they do have these reliability issues, then it's a good chance that Red Bull might come. Well, we were saying come at them really. This is rem- obviously if they have severe reliability issues, which it doesn't look like they will. Um, these are a couple of stoppages in pre-season testing that they may well have sorted out by the time Australia turns around. Yeah, once they've figured it all out and whatnot. But it reminds me of uh, 2005, uh, where McLaren had arguably the fastest car on the grid, but they lost the championship because of woeful reliability. Yeah. Now, to be fair, Merck over the past five years have had pretty bomb-proof reliability. Yeah. So I'm assuming they'll get it sorted. It was just a few uh, issues when uh, Rosberg won. Obviously, Hamilton should have realistically won that by skill, but because his car kept breaking, or he had a few unlucky, yeah, a few unlucky incidents, it meant Rosberg won the. He won the championship in 2016. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I would say that Merck are looking very, very strong. Yeah, again out of the gates. Yeah, and we. We're discussing this last night when we were watching season two of Drive to Survive. We're just thinking, sort of, um, this is the, their main, final chance in the current domination years because when the regs change in 2021, that could turn everything on its head, and we don't know it yet. But this is their final chance at a current setup style yeah, thing. Yeah, under to, the sta- under the current yeah. regulations, under the current generation of F1 yeah, cars, this is their last win. opportunity. Yeah, yeah, I think they will. But yeah, and the smart money would say that. Yeah. Um, another winner was Red Bull. Um, obviously, looking at the way that they've been running, some would argue that they have leapfrogged Ferrari to be the second best on the grid. And I honestly hope they do. Well, that's the thing. Because obviously, this is fascinating because although Red Bull had a really good preseason testing, Ferrari looked like they were um, a little sketchy, if I'm being honest. Well, yeah. And this isn't just me being praised. I don't, I don't like the Ferrari F1 team. I like the drivers. I just don't like the team. I think that uh, quite often they get the sort of stereotype of, um, you know, they get an unfair advantage, obviously, um, with the amount of money that they get paid just for showing up, 
Um, I don't necessarily think that's very fair. It's not fair at all. I know they're a big name in the sport and they've been in it for a long, long time, but it's meant to be sport, and sport's meant to be yeah. a level playing field. And, in and a lot particularly of ways. when they already have a big budget anyway, yeah. that money could be much better used. Even if they give every team the same amount of money, yeah, then that would make it a bit fairer. But yeah, just give to it. be fair, a cost cap is coming in. It is. That so is true. So they, they obviously, clearly, the FIA and obviously the chiefs of F1 understand the issue because yeah. they are looking to improve it so maybe into the future it won't be such a prevalent thing and that's the thing with all the big teams because they can massively outspend the independent outfits and it's not really fair well look at, look at mercedes in terms of money back in them they are by far probably the biggest on the on the grid then mclaren ferrari and red bull have a substantial budget that they bring with them well so do renault now yeah, renault. they've got yeah, the whole renault. of renault putting everything behind them like it's a big manufacturing company behind them with a lot of money not Mercedes level, but... And then when you compare that to someone like Williams, you can understand why they struggle. Oh, 100%. You know? Yeah, 100%. So, Ferrari, it's interesting, because I remember this time last year, all the buzz around Ferrari being oh, potentially faster than Mercedes. And yeah. None of that this year. There yeah, has been none, none of that. So, we'll see how that goes. Um, another winner, obviously, Racing Point. Now, I know everybody's been very quick to jump on it and say that they've just took the W10 from last year and copy and pasted it. They do look very similar. Yeah, there's a few subtle differences. But, in there, but... And I will say as well, I don't understand if there's anything wrong with that. You're running the same engine as the Mercedes team. Why wouldn't you take inspiration from the championship winning car? Yeah, and also as well, because last year's Mercedes car was still very quick like they like we discussed discussed it off mic they could like you said be bothering sort of the top end of the midfield I'm frankly very su- comfortably I'm surprised this hasn't happened sooner oh yeah actually yeah because as you say with Mercedes being such a dominant force and the fact that the racing point runs a Mercedes power unit it would make sense to go with a similar architecture 100% so yeah I think credit to them they're taking their chances and if it works out for them, going from what the drivers were saying, they felt very happy. As you say, um, I saw uh, Sergio Perez said it was, I think it was one of the best racing cars he'd ever driven. So he was very optimistic about where that car could and go. And he is a good driver. So if he can make the most out of this car, I'm not, it's very possible it could be up there. I'm not entirely certain this will bother the top three. No, no. I think that is a bit of a, they've moved on again, haven't yeah. they? But like you say, that, the next one's down, like again we discussed, like sort of maybe bothering sort of the likes of McLaren and Renault. And, oh, for best of the and, rest and best of the hundred percent, best I, of the rest. I think they could be up there because that car is still as quick, if not quicker, than some of the new cars of this year. Oh, I'd be very curious to see if we saw the Mercedes W10 out in Australia this year, where it would actually qualify. I suspect it would still be mixing it up at the top end of the best of the rest. Yeah. I definitely think so. And I honestly hope they do. I, I feel a bit sorry for Racing Point in some ways, but... Not credit made, to them. Yeah, they made yeah. a sensible decision, I think, in their point of view. And if they can get up to the top, that'll be good for them. They have a modest budget and they're doing the best, I think, one of the smartest things you can do with a modest budget. So yeah. fair enough. Do what the big guys do. Yeah. So I like that. Um, Alfa Romeo, obviously, um, it looked like they were struggling. So we'll see, I guess. They might pull something out of the bag. You never know, but... Yeah, it's one of those things. Um, yeah. I haven't really. I think one of the things is quite surprising is some of the teams I haven't really heard much about on pre-season testing. No. So obviously, one of the big winners in a lot of ways, obviously, is Williams. Um, I do agree with that. With the respect that where you compare to their pre-season testing of 2019, the fact that they showed up on time. As a matter of fact, they were the first out. Yeah. On the first I, day. I think f- from their point of view, it's also a pride point of view. They know they don't have the budgets of the big guys. They know they don't have the resources like in terms of manpower that the big guys have. So for them, I think it was sort of a pride thing to make sure that they were there. Well, also and coming save, back from 2019. Yeah. You know. Save the embarrassment that you had last time showing up two days late to testing. I think that I think they've just got it in their head now that we need to do this. It is interesting how they haven't gone down the same route as um, the Racing Point, whereas both of them share Mercedes power units, and they have developed their own independent car. They have. So we'll see how that turns out. Um, 
And I would say, obviously, I am optimistic for McLaren as well, and Renault had a good innings as well. So I think that's a good general overview of how pre-season testing went. One of the things I wanted to move on to briefly was um, some of my hopes I have for some of the teams going yeah. into 2020. Well, I've got a few myself as well, yeah. so we can go through those, which would be all right. Do you want to kick us off with them? Um, I think the first one to kick us off with is Williams, since we're talking about them. I think my hope for Williams in 2020 is that they're able to race with a car or a set of cars that isn't themselves. Yeah, they're not just trailing at the back. They want to be at least tussling with someone, having a dogfight. I don't care who, frankly, just so long as they're not so far off the pace that they can't even race with someone else. So I'm hoping that they'll get that opportunity. It gives George Russell and Nicholas Lafitte an opportunity to show their skills as well. Yeah, which would be really nice because, like you say, that... When they are racing at the back, well, I say racing, when they're just driving around at the back, just basically just going around and b- to bring the car home, you don't get to show off anything. You don't get to show, like, if you get into a dogfight with someone, how you'd handle it. You don't get to see how you go under pressure. No. Because there is no pressure, is it? It's just turn up, lose, go home every race. And it was a bit of a, well, probably a bit of a depressive thing for the drivers, especially. Well, you got to think, George Russell is well regarded as an excellent talent in sort of motor racing. He needs the opportunity to show the big boys in Formula 1 what he can do. And he can only do that if he's able to race other people. Yeah. So that's what I'm hoping. And my extremely optimistic hope is that they can get into Q2 once or twice over the next season. Okay. So that's top 15. Yeah, uh, as far as getting to the top 15 in qualifying. So they don't have to get any further than that. I just like that once or twice. It's progress. It is it progress. Would show, but that would show big progress yeah, to me. Yeah, and I think that would be good for them. It'd be good, it'd be good for team morale as well, I think. Really big boost. That really good for team morale. Yeah. Uh, one of my hopes is, as we've probably discussed this many times, but I do want to see McLaren at least getting up there. Not necessarily podiums, like you say, but at least maybe challenging the best of the rest sort of fourth fifth sort of position what you say they they rolled out a last season in fourth and they, did. they they had a good season last season and they inherited a podium in brazil courtesy of a lewis hamilton penalty i would like as he said my optimistic hope for mclaren is for them to consolidate their fourth position i don't think they have the pace to go to red bull yet I no, I don't. I, I don't either. However, if they could consolidate fourth and get a podium on merit, so not just obviously with the, yeah. as in win it on track, well, what that would be a good target. For Again, me. this this might be merit, might not be, but I think if they're running a solid fourth, and I mean like a, a solid fourth position, mm. and then if Ferrari are as bad as what it looks like they might be, and Red Bulls jump frog, like leapfrog them, if for, if McLaren can challenge Ferrari and maybe their strategists mess it up a bit as usual and that's what I mean. if they come past. If they could get themselves a third position, maybe with a bit of luck involved, it doesn't yeah. really matter. There's always luck involved. So if they can get a third position on track and finish fourth, finish com- comfortably in fourth position this season, I think that's another big step towards bringing it to being a regular appearance yeah. on because the podium. we know they can do it. They've done it in the past and they've let, up until recently, they had a lot more actual overall race entries and race wins more than Ferrari it's dropped off now but well you look at where they've come from from recent years if you look at how McLaren and Honda were in 2015 compared to where they are now it's shown an enormous amount of progress yeah and I think in two on two levels I think Honda's done very well with Red Bull to get back into a winning they've got a winning car so credit to them and I also think credit to McLaren for being able to bring themselves back up. And as you say, they got that podium last season. I'd like to see them get another this season. Well, hopefully, say the, the new guy will turn them around completely. Yeah, the uh, guy from Porsche. Yeah, hopefully hopefully he will do it. Well, this will be his first full season exactly. at the so, helm. Yeah, so let's exactly. see what he so, can do. He's got the right brains for it. He's got the right strategies for stuff like this. I think he, if there's anyone can do it, this guy can. If last season's anything to go off, yeah. if he can continue that momentum... I wouldn't be at all surprised if you could see them as a contender in 2021 no, well, with I the said, new reg shake up. I have read actually that, that they were, and I assume the other teams are doing this as well, but I've, they are putting a lot of effort already and a lot of resources in for the last couple of, like they even say, six months into the 2021 development well, they, stage, but no, in the background. No one wants to get caught out again like everyone got caught out in 2014 when the regs changed. Yeah. Because in 2014, I imagine a lot of them were caught napping. Merck really pushed on it. 
And off the back of that, they've had probably one of the most dominant periods in F1 history. Yeah. Without question. The only other dominance I can think of of a similar magnitude was the early 2000s Ferrari dominance with Michael Schumacher. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So, no, I think everybody's investing in it because no one wants to be in that situation in 2021. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll have to see that then come out. So we'll see. But I hope they can. That, well, yeah, so that's one of my hopes. Hopefully, let's say a podium, but I want a solid fourth finish. Like a solid yeah, fourth That's finish. what I mean, yeah. As in, yeah. no one, they have consolidated it. They're absolutely unequivocally fourth, which I think is going to be a big challenge for them, especially with Renault having such a good performance in pre-season testing. Yeah. So... Is there any drivers that you'd like to see do anything I'd special? Like, I'd like George Russell to do something special, if I'm being honest, uh, because again, I, he, he is a talent and he never got an opportunity to show himself. Yeah, nice bloke too, by the yeah. like, sounds of it. I would like to see how Leclerc and Sebastian Vettel go. Yeah, I, I get this because of a country. I think Leclerc's a better driver. Well, this is the thing, because if you look at last season, it would be reasonable to assume that they're going into this season at the very least on an even keel with one another. I don't think there is necessarily a clear first driver in that mix. There isn't, and I think that is good. But from the skill I've seen, last year Vettel cracked under pressure a lot. Yeah, there's been a lot of spins. And messed up, whereas Leclerc did seem to handle himself a little bit better. Yeah. Um, So hopefully they might be able to um, iron that out of Zeb and... Maybe have a few fights and a few battles on the track. Lando Norris and Sainz. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'd like to see yeah. where that leads because obviously it's very friendly at the moment. I, but yeah. if they do get a competitive car that's, ca- that's capable of being on the podium fairly regular-ish, I'd love to see how that relationship And, and that's actually good because I do think both of them actually do have the talent. If the car is up for it, I would think both yeah. of them have the talent to actually pull it off. Yeah. Because they're both great drivers and I think they both, well... Seem like nice Pete, nice guys as well, so it'd be nice to see either of them on there. And that's the thing, and I think it's all great at the moment because the car isn't realistically capable of getting onto the podium. If they end up in a car that is capable of that, we've seen how relationships do deteriorate. Like Rosberg and Hamilton's a great example of oh, that. They, yeah, they, they didn't. They didn't. In 20, they grew up as mates in a lot of ways. And in 2013, when the car wasn't a regular sort of challenger for the top position, it was quick and they did get a win or two every now and then, but their relationship was still all right. It was 2014 when they had the dominant car and they knew it was the world champion was going to be either one of them. Yeah. That's when things really deteriorated. But I think, that, I know that a lot of the stuff we only see on screen, like behind the scenes you don't know how they might be I know they did see a lot of stuff maybe a slight of camera where they might shout and scream at each other but when they're on track I think most racing drivers are in that mind that I am in this to win oh yeah yeah. regardless if it's your teammate if yeah. it's anyone else you're in it to win it and like I say you're probably not a racing driver if you're not thinking like that but off the track if you can keep it separate then I, I hope they can as you said I think Drive to Survive re- summed it up really well obviously with what's going to happen in this season one of them is a lot of the big names in the current seats in F1, their contracts are up at the end of this season. Everyone's going to be out there trying to impress. Silly season this year is going to be hilarious. Yeah. Who's moving to where, you know, where some of the big names might be going. Mm. And everyone knows that in during silly season, when you're caught in some of the big seats, you have to impress. Oh, of course. So I think that might just be a recipe for just a disaster. Well, just uh, quickly, just a slight change of topic on the back of this, because you, you, you did mention it off microphone that we think with a lot of the stuff going around at the moment with coronavirus, mm. um, obviously Switzerland has banned events over a thousand people. France is 5,000 people. Chinese Grand Prix Chinese already Chinese Grand Prix is already cancelled. There is a very, very, very strong possibility that others could be cancelled. So as you were saying, each race counts. Oh yeah. You, you Honestly, I don't know. No one knows what's going to happen. As you say, I mean, where does this leave the French Grand Prix? If they've been, obviously that doesn't happen until the summer, so we might have a better handle on things by that point. Yeah, but we'll just have to see, won't we? Yeah, it's uh, and I think it's it's a a good place to see where where it'll end up because if they say half the races get cancelled, what's going to happen? That's the thing. Every single race will count because you never know when that might actually be the end of the championship. No, I agree. It could only be three rounds long for all we know. Yeah. Two? One? That's so. fine. Quickly off the back of that, we're going to have a look at the newly announced Morgan Plus 4. Yep. 
which is something that caught my eye straight away. And as soon as it got announced, I did send it straight over to you because I knew you would love this car. Um, mainly because of the way it looks, and it's a Morgan. It's a classic British brand, but also it's something a bit more... I, I think know, it's, more, pro- it's more pro- up my street. Yeah, that's what, that's what as soon as I saw it, I thought it's a bit more up street. Like I say, manual gearbox. It's a much smaller, lighter car. I think it's definitely for you. I would say that, and I'm going to go controversially on this one, um, I prefer this to the plus six, and if it was my money, I'd be having this over the plus six. Probably would agree with you on that one. I mean, it's only 44 grand. I say only, That's but that's for what you get. For this is a coach-built coach yeah, car. It's pretty much bespoke. Yeah, you could, you can with Morgan. I know you can. You can obviously spend a lot of time with the designers and like the the, the upholsterers and the woodworkers and everything, and basically customize it to how you want it. Fair enough. If you did that, you might spend up slightly over forty four grand. But if you just go for a basic color, basic leather, and everything else, forty four grand, I think is an absolute bargain. Yeah. For a coach built car. Um, a few of the stats we're looking at on this thing. So it's obviously a four cylinder engine, as it's called the plus four. Yeah. Um, it's 154 brake horsepower from a Ford derived two liter engine, mm-hmm. uh, not to 16, seven and a half seconds and a dry weight of 927 kilograms. So probably call it a ton bang on wet weight. And I think the thing to note is outright, outright performance is not obviously the main selling point of this car. They never have been. That being said though, yeah. in something that's got a dry weight of under a ton, 154 brake horsepower is enough. Yeah. Well, absolutely it's 150 enough. 150 horsepower per ton. Yeah, it's absolutely enough. So, yeah, that sounds great to me. And as you say, we were both very interested, obviously. It's got a five-speed manual gearbox compared to the Plus 6, which you can only get in an automatic at the moment. Yeah, which is a real shame because that engine's crying out for a manual. But that's the thing, though, obviously. So it's got a Mazda five-speed gearbox and a Ford engine. We both went into this assuming that it would be a four-pot derived from BMW or something, given that's where they got the straight yeah, six from. Yeah, it's partner in some respects, so isn't it? Clearly, they've got other partners that they're pulling things from. Well, I think in this sort of thing, you can you well, Caterham as well do. Caterham use Ford, Ford engines for this sort of stuff, and they're, the, they're not the same, but they are lightweight little handmade cars in, in England, in, aren't they? In certain ways, they I th- are, yeah. I think Ford have always dominated in that. Arena. In that sort of arena, because like they've powered Caterhams for God knows how long. I know you can put any engine in a Caterham, really, but uh, they also say they've done, they have done Morgans before, um, and they've got a variety of other cars. Um, I'm surprised if it, it wouldn't surprise me, you know, if eventually they do, they put the Eco Boost in one of these, an even smaller one. No, that doesn't surprise me at all. I think once it becomes older technology and Ford no longer has a, a full purpose for yeah, it, yeah, they, they can afford it. They, can afford they it. will pass it down to coach builders, I imagine, and to do what they will with them. Um, obviously, one of the cars this is going up against is worth noting is the Caterham Seven. Hundred percent, yeah. Especially the one that has the Suzuki derived three cylinder one liter engine. Yeah. So that I think that is squarely well, this, against this. Yeah, this. this is actually quicker as well. I know it's, it is heavily up on power, that little Suzuki engine. It's like nearly, it's under 100. It's under 100, that yeah. Much, and, yeah. And obviously the Caterham is lighter. There's no beating around the bush there. Exactly. So but I, that extra 50 brake does make a difference. And I think with the Morgan, you are getting a bit more of a car. It's more of, and I also think with the Morgan as well, you're probably getting a little bit more of a, uh, as far as the remit of what the Morgan will do is wider than the remit of what the 7 will do. 100%, yeah. It's a bit more practical. You can, yeah. like, I love seeing, I see a lot of, I actually do see quite a lot of Morgans driving around um, and they've got, a lot, I see a lot of them with a little basket on the back and mm. everything's going in it. You can't really do that in a Caterham. There's not really much boot space. No. And you are a bit cramped inside. But one thing that caught my eye on these, again, is a, the interior, other than the manual gearbox, is quite similar to the 6 uh, in many respects. Um, just the one that we've got an example on Morgan's website has got a lovely dark sort of, would you call it mahogany? Yeah, it's like a walnut. Yeah, like but, a, yeah. yeah like a dark, really dark wood dashboard. Uh, but uh, <laughs> the leather caught your eye. Right? I know that's the one that came for you. It's like a really nice it's tan, uh, tanned it? yeah. leather, um, which it does actually suit the car very well, which is in the dark blue uh, in the example they have. Um, I actually really like the spare wheel on the back as well. I know that's traditional, but yeah, I think it really suits the car. I would say, as you say, so if we're talking about competitors for this car, especially within... Obviously, I think the Caterham 7 with the one litre engine is certainly in there. Uh, we both discussed that the, obviously it's more money than this one, but the Jaguar F-Type with the two litre. Yeah, I mean, it's significantly more powerful as well. But then again, it's getting on for double the weight. Yeah. So I would love to see, as you said, at some point we'll compare the 0 to 60 stats on the on the uh, F-Type two litre to see where that actually puts it out. Because I bet it's closer than you think. Oh, I, oh yeah, 100%. I, I think it will be. But it's nearly got half the power though. 
So it's yeah, you you would hope the jag is quicker. Yeah, you would. And it, but to be fair, it, I think it is just from when we looked at it before. But and in the corners, undoubtedly, it will be because it's a much more modern architecture. You say that though, weight does kill you in the corners. Yeah, but I mean, as in the Morgan still has wood. Yeah. in it I mean yeah. don't get me wrong they've got a lot of aluminium in there now these days and I do know from reviewers especially with the plus six I've not seen any reviews on the plus four but if the plus six is anything to go by and I imagine they've used a similar architecture it's more modern than it's ever been to drive yeah and I think I think that's why a lot of people buy them because you can drive this car you get into it and drive it like any other normal modern car you've just got the style and looks of something from, like you say, the 50s. I think that's the thing. And I think these are the cars that sold these. I'd actually sit this in the same sort of group as um, the Eagle Speedster, for example, yeah. and the Stinger Porsche, and the Singer Porsches from so, yeah. California. Similar sort of premise, but a bit, obviously a slightly the more prices, market, the, But this yeah. is the thing, though, because you're getting the similar sort of experience which is the styles of yesteryear but modern technology powering it forwards so basically you get the looks that you want with the reliability and the want, performance yeah. that you want obviously this is a much more accessible way into that yeah. way of motoring 44 though. grand a lot of people can afford that yeah exactly whereas you compare that with the eagle speed so as much as i love them yeah, and what are they? Eight hundred grand. It, some of them are ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I think I've even seen one up for sale for over a million. Well, well it wouldn't million, surprise me but, on the resale market. Yeah, no, because the tech. I think if you order one, it'd be a couple of years before you actually get it, given the fact that it's all handmade. Everything has to be sourced, and but it's very done. difficult to pick out a competitor for these cars. I mean, obviously the plus six, its natural competitor is um, like the BMW Z4, the new one, since they have well, the, same the same engine. engine. Yeah. So same that's engine a natural it. competitor. But with this plus four, considering there isn't another sports car quite like it either. Not for the price as well. Not for the price, exactly. And but even, even when you look higher up in the price band or even lower, like... You could argue in many ways, not not prices, but it literally is half the price, but you could argue an MX-5... Um, yeah, in, same, same. In, in some respects, it's, it's a, a light, similar light yeah, car, lightweight roadster with you can get them with around 150 horsepower with a manual in the middle. Yeah. And ironically, the ones with about 150 horsepower from a two litre sort of four cylinder well, engine, yeah. much like this one. And Ford used to own Mazda, and it's a lot of the parts from them are uh, still sort of Ford drive engine bits. So you do would be it, interesting. It be. I mean, they are half the price, but that's not the point. Like car wise and type wise, I think they go well together. They do, yeah, yeah. I fair want to go in a Morgan. I really, really want to go in one. Yeah, we've both. It's weird, yeah. isn't it? We've been at Goodwood on multiple occasions now, and we've enjoyed very much what Morgan has brought along. That was where we saw the plus six last yeah. year. I think for proper car people, like I know a lot of people might not like the looks of the old styling, and in some ways I kind of agree, but this car and the what it represents and everything like that is why people fall in love with cars. Yeah. Good, lightweight, not much power, manual gearbox, rear-wheel drive... That is a proper car. That will drive better than anything you get from like the likes of RS3s, um, any, uh, for, for even Focus RSs, things like that. Oh, that yeah, but it, just, I would argue but, that in some yeah. respects you get a more pure experience than even like a Fiesta ST, for example. Oh, yeah, definitely. And especially if this were like with the wind in your hair and the roof down. I would say that this is probably one of the things I'm looking forward to most about Goodwood. And I wouldn't be at all surprised that when we come round to do our Goodwood... So long as it's not cancelled. So long as it's not cancelled. Yeah. If it's not cancelled and we come round to do our Goodwood wish list, yeah, this will be on it for me. 100%. The yeah. things that I want to see. Yeah, and, and I, I would agree with you on that one. I, I'd quite like to see it and have a yeah. bit of a nosy round. And then we can also give our opinions on it when we've seen it in the flesh as well. Yeah. Uh, which would be nicer. Um, so what we'll do, we'll we'll wrap that up there. I think that's a good place to end it, just after the Morgan. Um, but as always, again, links are in the description for everything. If you want us to sub, uh, do a topic for you, just submit that on any of the social media uh, outlets that we have available, uh, and we will try and cover that for you. Uh, if not, we will be back next week uh, with another episode. Uh, so we'll see you then. Yep. Yeah, see you later. See you later. Bye bye.